So far in Kill a Cures, we've seen how a chemical found in the venom of a cone snail was first developed as a medicine for treating pain. Then we heard about how cone snail venoms are currently being studied in a bid to find an alternative to the opioid-based medications that are causing the ongoing opioid crisis in America. This time, we'll see how that cone snail research is actually being done, both in the Philippines and in the USA. We'll see step by step how scientists can take a cone snail collected from the Philippines and from it create a totally new medicinal product. <laughs> Over the years, Toto and his team have developed an arsenal of techniques for studying cone snail venom, right up from the very basic to the cutting edge of modern biotechnology. We have had unique access to the research work, but there's so much to cover in this topic that we're actually going to split the subject across two episodes. The first part will take us to the Philippines to hunt down some killer snails and extract the deadly venoms. The second part will focus on the mind-boggling techniques scientists use to carry out their work in a modern neuroscience lab. Before any research can begin, Toto and his team need to visit the oceans where wild cone snails thrive. To the marine biodiversity hotspot known as the Philippines in Southeast Asia. They aren't the only ones looking for marine snails. The Philippines is host to a well-established export industry based around the buying and selling of seashells. The shells are collected by fishermen and then sold as souvenirs or curios or even incorporated into artworks and ornaments with some being worth many thousands of dollars. The fishermen have many specialized methods of collecting seashells at their disposal. For deep sea specimens, they can use nets. A large net is lowered down to the seabed and left for several weeks or even months. For deep sea specimens, they use a technique called lumen lumen fishing. Ang gilay on one half kilometer, mo 140 to 150 patum. It sits on the seafloor for long enough to develop a kind of mini ecosystem, with creatures of all kinds using it for shelter or simply becoming entangled in the net. When the net is eventually pulled up, the fishermen sort through the catch and keep anything they might be able to sell. This shell collecting industry is very useful for the researchers. The fishermen have unique knowledge that they can use to target the exact cone snails that the researchers are looking for. During the cone snail collection trips in the Philippines, Toro's team set up a temporary lab, this one in a beach resort. Some cone snails can be collected by the researchers themselves during the trip, but for the rest, Orders are placed with fishermen, and the cone snails get delivered alive directly to the lab. This field lab is only a temporary setup. The real venom research can't be done here. What they can do here is dissect the snails and extract two important samples from each. The first is a sample from the foot of the snail. This will be used for DNA analysis. The second sample is the snail's venom duct. This duct contains the snail's pure venom. The samples are labeled and packaged in a way that preserves them so that they can be shipped to the Marine Science Institute in Manila and to Toto's lab in Utah in the USA, where they will be processed and analyzed. The samples have arrived in the lab. Two samples were taken from each snail, one from the fleshy foot of the snail and the other from the venom duct. Before they analyzed the venom to find the chemical compounds with medical potential, 
scientists need to identify each of the snails they've collected. This can't be done accurately by sight alone, since closely related snail species can have some very similar looking shells. To accurately determine the exact snail species, scientists will need the fleshy foot of the snail and some very specialist equipment. Here's Marin Watkins, an expert in this field. She goes through a series of steps to extract the DNA from the snail's foot sample, ultimately producing a readout that she stores on the computer. When we're ready to do the analysis, we slice off a small portion of the foot and it goes into a buffer that dissolves the tissue. Um, and then we get rid of the RNAs that are around because you just want the DNA. And then we get rid of the proteins. So this is just a procedure where you have multiple steps of chemical reactions. And then finally, you um, change the solubility and the DNA falls out of solution. And you have your DNA. And then that goes for sequencing. This DNA code obtained from the cone snail acts like a genetic fingerprint. This code is then compared to the DNA of all the other cone snails that have been studied in the past. If this type of cone snail is a species that has been worked on before, a match will be found, identifying the cone snail. In case it's a new species that's never been studied before, Marin can use something called a phylogenetic tree to find out where on the evolutionary tree of cone snails this cone snail fits. Once you have the sequence, you do something called nearest neighbor analysis. And so what you're doing is you're taking, it's a computerized program. There's lots of different ways to do it, but that's the way we do it. And there's, it's a computerized program where you compare every sequence to every other sequence and determine which are the two most closely related. And then from there, which are the next most closely related and the next, and then you express it as a tree. So it's just basically showing the closest relatives together and then branching out into a tree as they diverge. Using another complex biotech process, Marin is able to extract genetic material called RNA from the venom ducts of the snail. The genetic data in the RNA can be turned into a human readable code called a transcriptome. A transcriptome is an analysis of the RNA for us specifically in the venom duct because the venom duct is devoted almost entirely to making toxins. This transcriptome from the venom duct can be thought of like a recipe book for the snail's venom. It contains recipes for all of the chemicals that are found in the venom. And what's nice about a transcriptome is it shows you everything that's in there and in what abundance. Remember these phylogenetic trees and transcriptomes. They'll become important as we start to look at what scientists do with the other samples they took. Cone snail venom is typically composed of a couple of hundred conopeptides. Each one has a different biological function, so some of them might have a medical use. The goal here is to find those medically useful conopeptides, but with 200 conopeptides per species and over a thousand species of cone snail, how are scientists ever going to test them all? The first step is to narrow down a list of priority fractions, conopeptides with the highest chance of having some medical application. Those can be put through the full set of tests and the others set aside. With that in mind, let's look at a venom duct. In each venom duct is just a bit of crude venom, venom that was in the snail's venom gland when it was dissected. So let's meet Victor and see how he extracts the crude venom. He grinds the venom duct into a solution and then filters it to remove the bits of venom duct tissue. Now that the pure crude venom is prepared, it gets separated out into its individual conopeptides using a process called high-performance liquid chromatography. Great, we've got pure conopeptides. Now, to find the priority fractions, they'll perform a test on live animals and look for a reaction. While the aim is to find drugs that work on humans, they can't test potentially lethal toxins on people. 
the Food and Drug Administration in the United States requires that you show that a compound have beneficial effects before you go into trials in humans. The conopeptides get injected into the mice, and if they're bioactive, a reaction like scratching, shaking, or sleeping would be seen. If the mouse does react, then that conopeptide gets added to the list of priority fractions that are worth testing further. These priority fractions will be put through a ton of different tests from here onwards. But there's one problem. See, there are only a few drops of each conopeptide. Cone snails don't produce much venom. So to get enough of a conopeptide that you want to work on, you would need a huge number of snails. And it gets even worse when you consider what comes after. Say you turn one of these into a medicine. It's super popular, and orders come in by the thousands. But each dose of your medicine takes 500 snails to make. Having to scrounge around for tens of thousands of snails just isn't practical. Scientists have an ingenious solution for this. It turns out that you don't need the cone snail to produce its conopeptides. Once you have some of it, it's possible to find out the exact building blocks that make it up, and then fabricate your own completely artificially. Here's Josh. He's doing exactly that, analyzing a conopeptide with a process called mass spectrometry. This process shows him exactly which chemical building blocks make up the conopeptide, and how they're arranged in order. At this point, you can think of the conotoxin as a string of beads. The beads are amino acids that make up the protein sequence. So what the mass spectrometer would do further is to fragment this into individual amino acids or beads, and then you can do um, a sort of calculation for which you will be able to identify using differences in mass the exact amino acid sequence of your conotoxin. They're then ready to synthesize their own artificial copy of the conopeptide, meaning that they can produce as much as they want of it without ever having to reach for a cone snail again. Now this is important because you know, Mother Nature doesn't usually give us a lot of these conotoxins, so we could actually synthesize the conotoxins to do further testing and clinical um, testing. So, there you have it. We've seen how they took all the crude venom, put it through a test, found the priority fractions they want to test further, and found out how to make as much of those fractions as they want. You would think that they're done. After getting and testing all of the venom in the venom ducts, they can move on. I would think so too, but Toto and the team disagree. They know how to get samples of conopeptides they don't even physically have. And if you thought making conopeptides by analyzing their building blocks was weird, this is even weirder. You see, the crude venom we just examined was all of the venom left in the snail's venom duct when it was dissected. Crude venom contains many different conopeptides, but it doesn't contain all of the conopeptides that the snail knew how to make. This is because, from day to day, cone snails can change the exact makeup of their venom. What this all means is that we're missing a few conopeptides. Ones that the snail knew how to make, but didn't leave in its duct when it was dissected. This means that we could be overlooking a useful one. Let's liken the cone snails to bakers, and say we're trying to find the best pain-killing cookie in the world. Sadly, a baker has died i.e. we've dissected a cone snail. So, we check his pantry, and we find conopeptides A and B inside. We have conopeptides A and B right here, so we can easily test how good they are. 
But there are sure to be dishes the baker knew how to make, but didn't make the day before their death. We might never get to try these dishes, unless the baker left behind a recipe book. That way, we could recreate the dish exactly the same. The good news? We do have a recipe book. Just earlier, Marin Watkins made a transcriptome using RNA from the snail's venom gland. The transcriptome will contain instructions for making every single one of the snail's conopeptides. So by following it, scientists can create the conopeptides they don't already have. So, in addition to conopeptides A and B, we now have recipes for conopeptide C and D here in the transcriptome. Now, I have no idea what conopeptide C is, but conopeptide D looks familiar. So I checked the phylogenetic tree that Marin prepared, showing how different cone snail species are related, and look, a close relative of our dead baker made a conopeptide X that looks just like conopeptide D. Conopeptide X has already been studied in the past. It had potential as a painkiller. Only problem was, it didn't last very long, so it was rejected at clinical trials. But chances are, this conopeptide D will also be a painkiller. And if this one lasts longer, then it could have some real potential as a medication. So we can make some of conopeptide D and add it too to the list of priority fractions that the team will test further. So, we've learned how Toto and his team are able to take both venom and genetic data from live cone snails in the Philippines, and by various means, arrive at a short list of promising chemical compounds called conopeptides that they think have medical potential. In the next episode, we'll follow the most promising conopeptides into the next stages of testing, in the molecular neuroscience labs, where they'll continue their journey on their way to becoming medicinal compounds. Our assay is getting to the point where it's almost as fun as a video game. Uh, these are robots that control the application of fluids onto our cells. I'm Max Taylor, signing off from episode 4 of Killer Cures. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next episode for more Killer Cures! <laughs>